Chapter 5 Treats of the same subject as the last chapter and describes the flight of the spirit, which is another way by which God elevates the soul. This requires great courage in one experiencing it. This favor by which God greatly delights the soul is explained. This chapter is very profitable. There is another form of rapture which, though essentially the same as the last, yet produces very different feelings in the soul. I call it the flight of the spirit, for the soul suddenly feels so rapid a sense of motion that the spirit appears to hurry it away with a speed which is very alarming, especially at first. Therefore, I said that the soul on whom God bestows this favor requires strong courage besides great faith, trust, and resignation, so that God may do what he chooses with it. Do you suppose a person in perfect possession of her senses feels but little dismay at her soul's being drawn above her, while sometimes, as we read, even the body rises with it? She does not know where the spirit is going, who is raising her, nor how it happens. For at the first instant of this sudden movement, one does not feel sure it is caused by God. Can it possibly be resisted? No. Resistance only accelerates the motion, as someone told me. God now appears to be teaching the soul, which has so often placed itself absolutely in his hands and offered itself entirely to him, that it no longer belongs to itself. Thus it is snatched away more vehemently in consequence of its opposition. Therefore this person resolved to resist no more than does a straw when attracted by amber, a thing you may have seen. She yielded herself into the hands of him who is almighty, seeing it is best to make a virtue of necessity. Speaking of straw, doubtless it is as easy for a stalwart, strapping fellow to lift a straw as for our mighty and powerful giant to elevate our spirit. It seems that the cistern of water of which I spoke, but I cannot quite remember where, in the fourth mansion, was formerly filled gently and quietly, without any movement. But now this great God who restrains the springs and the waters and will not permit the ocean to transgress its bounds, lets loose the streams, which with a powerful rush flow into the cistern and a mighty wave rises, strong enough to uplift on high the little vessel of our soul. Neither the ship herself nor her pilot and sailors can at their choice control the fury of the sea and stop its carrying the boat where it will. Far less can the interior of the soul now stay where it chooses, or force its senses or faculties to act more than he who holds them in his dominion decrees. As for the exterior powers, they are here quite useless." Indeed, I am amazed, sisters, while merely writing of this manifestation of the immense power of this great king and monarch. Then what must be felt by those who actually experience it? I am convinced that if His Majesty were to reveal Himself thus to the greatest sinners on earth, they would never dare to offend Him again, if not through love, at least through fear of Him. What obligations bind those taught in so sublime a manner to strive with all their might not to displease such a master? In his name I beg of you, sisters, who have received these or the like favors, not to rest content with merely receiving them, but to remember that she who owes much has much to pay. This thought terrifies the soul exceedingly, unless the great courage needed was given it by our Lord, it would suffer great and constant grief, looking first at what His Majesty has done for it, and then upon itself it sees how little good it has performed compared with what it was bound to do, and that the paltry service it has rendered was full of faults, failures, and tepidity. To efface the remembrance of the many imperfections of all its good deeds, if indeed it has ever performed any, it thinks best to forget them altogether, and to be ever mindful of its sins, casting itself on the mercy of God, since it cannot repay its debt to Him, and begging for the pity and compassion He ever shows to sinners.
Perhaps he will answer as he did to someone who was kneeling before a crucifix in great affliction on this account, for she felt she had never had anything to offer God nor to sacrifice for his sake. The crucified one consoled her by saying that he gave her for herself all the pains and labors he had borne in his passion, that she might offer them as her own to his father. I learned from her that she at once felt comforted and enriched by these words which she never forgets, but recalls whenever she realizes her own wretchedness and feels encouraged and consoled. I could relate several other incidents of the same kind learnt in conversations with many holy people much given to prayer, but I will not recount them lest you might imagine they relate to myself. I think this example is very instructive. It shows that we please our Lord by self-knowledge, by the constant recollection of our poverty and miseries, and by realizing that we possess nothing but what we have received from him. Therefore courage is needed, sisters, in order to receive this and many other favors which come to a soul elevated to this state by our Lord. I think that if the soul is humble, it requires more valor than ever for this last mercy. May God grant us humility for his name's sake. To return to this sudden rapture of the spirit, the soul really appears to have quitted the body, which, however, is not lifeless, and though, on the other hand, the person is certainly not dead, yet she herself cannot, for a few seconds, tell whether her spirit remains within her body or not. She feels that she has been wholly transported into another and a very different region from that in which we live, where a light so unearthly is shown that, if during her whole lifetime she had been trying to picture it and the wonder seen, she could not possibly have succeeded. In an instant her mind learns so many things at once that if the imagination and intellect spent years in striving to enumerate them, it could not recall a thousandth part of them. This vision is not intellectual, but imaginary, and is seen by the eyes of the soul more clearly than earthly things are seen by our bodily eyes. Although no words are pronounced, the spirit is taught many truths. For instance, if it beholds any of the saints, it knows them at once as well as if intimately acquainted with them for years. Occasionally, besides what the eyes of the soul perceive in intellectual vision, other things are shown it. In an imaginary vision, it usually sees our Lord accompanied by a host of angels. Yet, neither the bodily eyes nor the eyes of the soul see anything. For these visions and many other things impossible to describe are revealed by some wonderful intuition that I cannot explain. Perhaps those who have experienced this favor and possess more ability than myself may be able to describe it, although it seems to me a most difficult task. I cannot tell whether the soul dwells in the body meanwhile or not. I would neither affirm that it does nor that the body is deprived of it. I have often thought that as, though the sun does not leave his place in the heavens, yet his rays have power to reach the earth instantaneously, so the soul and the spirit, which make one and the same thing, like the sun and its rays, may, while remaining in its own place, through the strength of the ardor coming to it from the true sun of justice, send up some higher part of it above itself. In fact, I do not understand what I am talking about, but the truth is that, with the swiftness of a bullet fired from a gun, an upward flight takes place in the interior of the soul. I know no other name for it but flight. Although noiseless, it is too manifest a movement to be any illusion, and the soul is quite outside itself. At least that is the impression made upon it. Great mysteries are revealed to it meanwhile, and when the person returns to consciousness, she is so greatly benefited that she holds all this world's goods as filth compared with what she has seen. Henceforth, 
earthly life is grievous to her, and what used to please her now remains uncared for and unnoticed. Those children of Israel who were sent on first to the land of promise brought back tokens from it. So here our Lord seems to seek to show the soul something of the land to which it is traveling, to give it courage to pass through the trials of its painful journey, now that it knows where it must go to find rest. You may fancy that such profit could not thus quickly be obtained, yet only those who have experienced what signal benefits this favor leaves in the soul can realize its value. This clearly shows it to be no work of the devil. Neither the imagination nor the evil one could represent what leaves such peace, calm, and good fruits in the soul, and particularly the following three graces of a very high order. The first of these is a perception of the greatness of God which becomes clearer to us as we witness more of it. Secondly, we gain self-knowledge and humility from seeing how creatures so base as ourselves in comparison with the Creator of such wonders have dared to offend Him in the past or venture to gaze on Him now. The third grace is a contempt for all earthly things unless they are consecrated to the service of so great a God. With such jewels the bridegroom begins to deck his bride, they are too valuable for her to keep them carelessly. These visions are so deeply engraved in her memory that I believe she can never forget them until she enjoys them forevermore, for to do so would be the greatest misfortune. But the spouse who gave her these gifts has power to give her grace not to lose them. I told you that courage was required by the soul for do you think it is a trifling matter for the spirit to feel literally separated from the body, as it does when perceiving that it is losing its senses without understanding the reason? There is need that he who gives all the rest should include fortitude. You will say this fright is well rewarded, and so say I. May he who can bestow such graces be forever praised, and may his majesty vouchsafe that we may be worthy to serve him. Amen. Chapter 6 Describes an effect which proves the prayer spoken of in the last chapter to be genuine and no deception. Treats of another favor our Lord bestows on the soul to make it praise him fervently. These sublime favors leave the soul so desirous of fully enjoying him who has bestowed them that life becomes a painful though delicious torture, and death is ardently longed for. Such a one often implores God with tears to take her from this exile, where everything she sees wearies her. Solitude alone brings great alleviation for a time, but soon her grief returns, and yet she cannot bear to be without it. In short, this poor little butterfly can find no lasting rest. So tender is her love that at the slightest provocation it flames forth and the soul takes flight. Thus, in this mansion, raptures occur very frequently, nor can they be resisted even in public. Persecutions and slanders ensue. However she may try, she cannot keep free from the fears suggested to her by so many people, especially by her confessors. Although in one way she feels great confidence within her soul, especially when alone with God, yet on the other hand she is greatly troubled by misgivings lest she is deceived by the devil and so should offend him who she deeply loves. She cares little for blame, except when her confessor finds fault with her, as if she could help what happens. She asks everyone to pray for her since she has been told to do so, and begs His Majesty to direct her by some other way than this which is so full of danger. Nevertheless, so great are the benefits left by these favors that she cannot but see that they lead her on the way to heaven, of which she has read and heard and learned in the law of God. As strive how she may, she cannot resist desiring to receive these graces, she resigns herself into God's hands. 
yet she is grieved at finding herself forced to wish for these favors which appears to be disobedience to her confessor, for she believes that in obedience and in avoiding any offense against God lies her safeguard against deception. Thus she feels she would prefer to be cut in pieces rather than willfully commit a venial sin, yet is greatly grieved at seeing that she cannot avoid unwittingly falling into a great number. God bestows on such people so intense a desire neither ever to displease him in however small a matter, nor to commit any avoidable imperfection, that, were there no other reason, they would try to avoid society, and they greatly envy those who live in deserts. On the other hand, they seek to live amidst men in the hopes of helping if but one soul to praise God better. In the case of a woman, she grieves over the impediment offered by her sex, and envies those who are free to proclaim aloud to all who is this mighty God of hosts. O oh, poor little butterfly, chained by so many fetters that stop thee from flying where thou wouldst! Have pity on her, O oh my God, and so dispose her ways that she may be able to accomplish some of her desires for thy honor and glory. Take no account of the poverty of her merits, nor the vileness of her nature, Lord, thou who hast the power to compel the vast ocean to retire, and didst force the wide river Jordan to draw back so that the children of Israel might pass through. Yet spare her not, for aided by thy strength she can endure many trials. She is resolved to do so. She desires to suffer them. Stretch forth thine arm, O Lord, to help her lest she waste her life on trifles. Let thy greatness appear in this thy creature, womanish and weak as she is, so that men, seeing the good in her is not her own, may praise thee for it. Let it cost her what it may, and as dear as she desires, for she longs to lose a thousand lives to lead one soul to praise thee but a little better. If as many lives were hers to give, she would count them well spent in such a cause, knowing as a truth most certain that she is unworthy to bear the lightest cross, much less to die for thee. I cannot tell why I have said this, sisters, nor what made me do so. Indeed, I never intended it. You must know that these effects are bound to follow from such trances or ecstasies. They are not transient, but permanent desires. When opportunity occurs of acting on them, they prove genuine. How can I say that they are permanent when at times the soul feels cowardly in the most trivial matters and too timorous to undertake any work for God? I believe it is because our Lord, for its greater good, then leaves the soul to its natural weakness, which at once convinces it so thoroughly that any strength it possessed came from His Majesty as to destroy its self-love, endowing it with a greater knowledge of the mercy and greatness of God which He deigned to show forth in one so vile. However, the soul is usually in the former state. Beware of one thing, sisters. These ardent desires to behold our Lord are sometimes so distressing as to need rather to be checked than to be encouraged, that is, if feasible, for in another kind of prayer of which I shall speak later, it is not possible, as you will see. In the state I speak of, these longings can sometimes be arrested, for the reason is at liberty to conform to the will of God and can quote the words of St. Martin. Should these desires become very oppressive, the thoughts may be turned to some other matter. As such longings are generally found in persons far advanced in perfection, the devil may excite them in order to make us think we are of their number. In any case, it is well to be cautious. For my part, I do not believe he could cause the calm and peace given by this pain to the soul, but would disturb it by such uneasiness as we feel when afflicted concerning any worldly matter. A person inexperienced in both kinds of sorrow cannot understand the difference, but thinking such grief an excellent thing will excite it as much as possible, which greatly injures the health, 
as these longings are incessant or at least very frequent. You must also notice that bodily weakness may cause such pain, especially with people of sensitive characters who cry over every trifling trouble. Times without number do they imagine they are mourning for God's sake when they are doing no such thing. If for a considerable space of time, whenever such a person hears the least mention of God or thinks of him at all, these fits of uncontrollable weeping occur, the cause may be an accumulation of humor round the heart which has a great deal more to do with such tears than has the love of God. Such persons seem as if they would never stop crying. Believing that tears are beneficial, they do not try to check them nor to distract their minds from the subject, but encourage them as much as possible. The devil seizes this opportunity of weakening nuns so that they would become unable to pray or to keep their rule. I think you must be puzzling over this and would like to ask what I would have you do as I see danger in everything. If I am afraid of delusions in so good a thing as tears, perhaps I myself am deluded, and maybe I am. But believe me, I do not say this without having witnessed it in other people, although not in my own case, for there is nothing tender about me, and my heart is so hard as often to grieve me. However, when the fire burns fiercely within, stony as my heart may be, it distills like an alembic. It is easy to know when tears come from this source, for they are soothing and gentle rather than stormy, and rarely do any harm. This delusion, when it is one, has the advantage, with a humble person, of only injuring the body and not the soul. But if one is not humble, it is well to be ever on one's guard. Let us not fancy that if we cry a great deal we have done all that is needed. Rather, we must work hard and practice the virtues. That is, the essential, leaving tears to fall when God sends them, without trying to force ourselves to shed them. Then, if we do not take too much notice of them, they will leave the parched soil of our souls well watered, making it fertile in good fruit, for this is the water which falls from heaven. However, we may tire ourselves in digging to reach it. We shall never get any water like this. Indeed, we may often work and search until we are exhausted without finding as much as a pool, much less a springing well. Therefore, sisters, I think it best for us to place ourselves in the presence of God, contemplate His mercy and grandeur, and our own vileness, and leave Him to give us what He will, whether water or drought, for He knows best what is good for us. Thus we enjoy peace, and the devil will have less chance to deceive us. Amongst these favors, at once painful and pleasant, our Lord sometimes causes in the soul a certain jubilation and a strange and mysterious kind of prayer. If he bestows this grace on you, praise him fervently for it. I describe it so that you may know it is something real. I believe that the faculties of the soul are closely united to God, but that he leaves them at liberty to rejoice in their happiness together with the senses, although they do not know what they are enjoying nor how they do so. This may sound nonsense, but it really happens. So excessive is its jubilee that the soul will not enjoy it alone, but speaks of it to all around so that they may help to praise God, which is its one desire. Oh, what rejoicings would this person utter, and what demonstrations would she make, if possible, so that all might know her happiness! She seems to have found herself again, and wishes, like the father of the prodigal son, to invite all her friends to feast with her, and to see her soul in its rightful place, because, at least for the time being, she cannot doubt its security. I believe she is right, for the devil could not possibly infuse a joy and peace into the very center of her being, which makes her whole delight consist in urging others to praise God. It requires a painful effort to keep silent and to dissemble such impulsive happiness. St. Francis must have experienced this when, as the robbers met him rushing through the fields crying aloud, 
he told them in answer to their questions that he was the herald of the great king. So felt other saints who retired into the desert so that, like St. Francis, they might proclaim the praises of their God. I knew Fray Peter of Alcantara, who used to do this. I believe he was a saint on account of the life he led, yet people often took him for a fool when they heard him. Oh, happy folly, sisters! Would that God might let us all share it! What mercy he has shown you in placing you where, if he gave you this grace and it were perceived by others, it would rather turn to your advantage than bring on you contempt as it would do in the world, where men so rarely hear God praised that it is no wonder they take scandal at it. Oh, miserable times and wretched life spent in the world! How blessed are those whose happy lot it is to be freed from them! It often delights me when, in my sister's company, to see how the joy of their hearts is so great that they vie with one another in praising our Lord for placing them in this convent. It is evident that their praises come from the very depths of their soul. I should like you to do this often, sisters, for when one begins, she incites the rest to imitate her. How can your tongues be better employed when you are together than in praising God who has given us so much cause for it? May His Majesty often grant us this kind of prayer, which is most safe and beneficial. We cannot acquire it for ourselves, as it is quite supernatural. Sometimes it lasts for a whole day, and the soul is like one inebriated, although not deprived of the senses, nor like a person afflicted with melancholia, in which, though the reason is not entirely lost, the imagination continually dwells on some subject which possesses it and from which it cannot be freed. These are coarse comparisons to make in connection with such a precious gift. Yet nothing else occurs to my mind. In this state of prayer, a person is rendered by this jubilee so forgetful of self and everything else that she can neither think nor speak of anything but praising God, to which her joy prompts her. Let us all of us join her, my daughters, for why should we wish to be wiser than she? What can make us happier? And may all creatures unite their praises with ours for ever and ever. Amen, amen, amen.